Pamela, you're muted. You are muted. See, I, when I produce, I unmute my cast for themselves. <laughs> That's good. How, how do you do that? You use the... Um, I can um, unmute you? Yeah, you use the control room tools. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. That's so thoughtful of you. <laughs> you really are a much better host than I am. I'm just a different host. Just a different host. Well, hey, Pamela, how's it going? It's going well. How's it going with you? Good. You're back in your familiar surroundings, back I, from I, your um, Portuguese vacation. It was not a vacation. Okay. I worked my ass off for a week. Yeah. Um, so did you get a chance to maybe watch some auroras? No, I was annoyingly either in light pollution or fog or rain or all three simultaneously. What about during that flight back? Did you take the Great Circle route? Did, could you look out the window? I flew during daylight. Mm. Yeah, so, so the way they normally do it is when you fly to Europe, it's an overnight flight. And when you fly home from Europe, it's a daytime flight. And so I flew during daylight. Yeah, we had uh, a series, like two big um, sunspot flares blast towards the Earth, and they gave us, a, you know, like a series of solar storms across, like, Friday... Now, did you get Saturday, to see it? Saturday, Sunday... No, I didn't either. Ugh. So most of Canada got a great view of it, but the West Coast didn't really get much of a view. But last night, there was a huge meteor that flew across the sky in British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and was visible in Southern California, in Northern California. Dang. Around 8.20 our time. And I was driving, it was two nights ago, and I was actually driving when it happened. So if it had been out my window, I would have totally seen it. But it just happened to go like over my head, and so I missed it. I, I, I've never felt so let down. <laughs> I keep saying the universe owes me a comet. It delivered a great big meteor, but I couldn't see it. That that is so very very sad. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah yeah. It's what's your fault? Um, Everything's my fault. I I totally take all, right, all blame. Good good. Uh, so if you've never seen this before, this thing we do, this is a, a live episode of Astronomy Cast. Today we're going to be doing episode three fifty two. Uh, water, water everywhere. And uh, we'll take about 30 minutes to record the show, and then when we're done, we'll stick around for a couple of minutes and answer some of your questions about space and astronomy. So um, what else? I want to say hi. Uh, if you want to like post your questions, you can use the Q&A app, which I've enabled. And I'm going to say hi to Thomas Traniker, Helga Bjorkog, Michael Mayer, Will I'd one -E, Nancy Graziano, Guido B. Wow. Rob Mance, the whole crew. Yeah. Douglas Crandall, Derek Tweedy, Rod Mole, Peter Waldman. So, hey, everybody. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, if you have some questions as we proceed during the show, just go ahead and post your questions into our uh, Q&A app. Um, and so, theoretically, this should be the episode that goes out next Monday. And there should be an episode coming out today for from last week. Yeah, and it's on the 365 feed. I need to poke at Preston, and if needs be, steal it from the 365 feed. Is that the, the Dragon Con one? Uh, no, the one on 365 is, uh, they just stripped the audio out of our Hangout last yeah. week. Yeah. Right. So, okay. Okay, no, but we should have the good audio, though. Preston. Yeah, no, yeah. I agree. Okay. Okay, All right, let's get rolling. Are you ready to record? I, I guess so. We can wait. No, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> I, I'm wandering over to the software that requires me to press a red button and it is recording in mono as good software should. So is mine. Um, okay, great. Uh, here comes an intro. Astronomy Cast, episode 352, Water, Water, Everywhere. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. Uh, have you got anything interesting to say about Cosmo Academy? Uh, we have a bazillion classes going on, so sign up now. Please, please, please. 
Yeah, I, I I don't I don't think I'll do the long version of this where I like just like listen everybody. Cosmo Academy is the greatest thing you could ever want, and you get to have these classes with amazing PhD researchers, and uh, they'll teach you everything about black holes and observational astronomy, and it's the best, and it's a reasonable price, and you can learn from these brilliant minds. So if you haven't already, go sign up. Why wouldn't you? All right. Cosmoacademy.org? Yes. Okay. So wherever we find water on Earth, we find life. And so, it makes sense to search throughout the solar system to find water. Well, here's the crazy thing. We're finding water just about everywhere in the solar system. So this changes our whole concept of the habitable zone. All right, Pamela, you put this one on the docket. What were you getting at? Well, so it used to be like when we started this show, uh, when people started talking about habitable zones and stuff, they were figuring, well, like that Goldilocks place where it's not too hot, it's not too cold, and you're able to support liquid water on the surface of the world. Well, we're now kind of finding liquid water everywhere in the solar system, um, and it's appearing more and more that what's actually required is something to prevent it sublimating away into the atmosphere um, and a good case of gravitational squishing. Right, which giant planets provide that in spades. Yes. Yeah. And, and then we're also finding places with water that I know I never expected. It looks like the um, World Series, formerly known as a planet, now known as the largest asteroid, still getting called a planet by some. It's a dwarf uh, planet. It's a dwarf. Um, so, so Ceres, it's starting to look like, even though it's not exactly undergoing tidal heating from anything, um, it looks like it may have cryovolcanism, which means maybe it also, for some weird reason, has subsurface oceans. So it's getting to be a pretty watery solar system out there. Right. So in the olden days seven years ago, well, <laughs> older than that. Astronomers figured the water was on Earth, the Earth is where the water is, that's that. Maybe Mars, but probably not. That's the, you know, we can see that it has, Mars has some, has some ice caps, so maybe there's some water there. Dry ice accounts yeah. for that quite nicely. Yeah. Um, but isn't there like water? Couldn't they sense yeah. detect water mixed in yeah. in that area? Yeah. So anyway, yes, yeah, and so that's it. And then, but now, but and then they know that there was icy moons around Saturn, and there's comets and all this kind of stuff. But it's all frozen snowballs. No, no water, no liquid water to be had. So, so what is our new understanding, and what and how are people sort of discovering this? It, it's really kind of shocking. What we're now finding is mercury doesn't have liquid water, but it does have water in the permanently shadowed regions in some of its polar craters. We are finding Venus is still a nasty, acidic, don't want to go there kind of place. We're not going to talk about it because really it doesn't have water. Wait, but what about below the surface? I mean, there's more water on Earth below, you know, there's mountains and mountains of water below the surface. You know, than we ever knew that we're and, finding these pockets, but ten kilometers down, mixed in with the right. rock. Right, and, and so you get ten kilometers down on Venus, it's a different place, right? Well, and we don't know. I mean, the crazy thing about Venus is it's one of the weirdest surfaces in terms of not understanding its volcanic history. It looks like every large period of time that we don't really know. It pretty much has a massive outbreak of volcanoes the way a teenager might have an outbreak of acne. It just, the whole thing balloons up at once and resurfaces. Now the question is, in the process, is it outgassing all of the volatiles that are stored deeper down? What, what exactly is going on during this massive process? We don't really totally completely understand. Right. So so Venus we're going to put into the other category of sure. not really well understood in that category but covered in really gross nasty. We'll put it in the send more rovers category. I, I, I'm not quite sure we're ready for rovers there but balloons that circulate in the atmosphere. No way, no way. They, um, 
is it Jeffrey Landis came up with a um, a Sterling engine that could keep a rover going on the surface of Venus for months. Awesome idea. Not planned to be built by anyone at the moment, though. Yeah, but in my mind, <laughs> in my mind, I'm okay. speculating. Okay, so... Please continue. So, yes. Uh, so, Earth, we kind of know we're kind of covered in water. The near-Earth asteroids that we're generally contending with, um, they s rotate... They generally don't have ices on them. You occasionally see evidence of volatiles have escaped. Uh, in the case of those that are really dead comets more than their plain old rocky asteroids. But for the most part, near-Earth asteroids in the inner part of the asteroid belt is a dry place. This is because the sun baked everything dry. I kind of bypassed Mars in there. Mars, liquid water that's extremely salty is what it appears. So it has briny water that is able to stay liquid at significantly lower temperatures than non-salt water can. That's good um, enough for life. That that's We sure have salt water here on Earth that supports life. Huh. And uh, so this, this salt, salt water is a bit saltier, more, I think, Dead Sea than Atlantic, but... Uh, there's potential there. So Mars has, it appears, subsurface water in the form of briny water. Then moving outwards, as we move out through the asteroid belts, go past Vesta, past the um, what we call the water line, the snow line in our solar system. This is that point in the solar system where the distance that you are away from the sun is such that things that formed during the early solar nebula formed with water and didn't get baked to the point of not having water anymore. This is part of why we wanted to send the Dawn spacecraft to both Vesta and Ceres as they formed on either side of this line, we think. Well, now it's it's appearing that as as we've been observing Ceres in the ramp up to getting the Dawn mission there, it's kind of looking like it may have cryovolcanism, which indicates water. That one's kind of confusing. Um, then as we move out, we have Jupiter next. We already knew Europa subsurface water, ice on the surface. It's it's kind of water in different phase states. But it's not the it's, only one. I mean, that's it, the. It's not. No, it's looking like Ganymede has water. Callista has water. Io is another kind of baked kind of place. Yeah. Lots of nasty volcanism. Kind of awesome, but not really a watery kind of world. Um, but then as we move out towards Saturn, we find the tiny wor worlds like Enceladus actually appear to also have these subsurface oceans as well. Um, and so it's kind of like subsurface oceans everywhere. And there's the question of now what are we going to find when we get to Pluto? Pluto, so, right. So Pluto and Chiron are certainly close enough that perhaps, maybe, sort of, you could end up with some sort of tidal heating. Don't know. Probably not. But wow, what if? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the solar system is turning out to be much more watery than previously thought. So, of all of those places, which one is the best candidate? Which is the best place for us to look, do you think? The, the one that I didn't name, uh, Titan. So, so Titan, you actually have massive organics already in place. This is a world that has methane and ethane uh, at the transition point where they can go from vapor to liquid to solid. And... With that triple point in play, you, you end up with a whole weather system. You end up with lakes that, uh, depending on where they are, are either methane or ethane. Majority, it's looking like they're majority methane. But there is also water in this crazy environment. And so you know you have all the organics. You have a complex water cycle, or liquid cycle, rather. You do have water. So... That's an excellent starting point, and as has been noticed before, its atmosphere is actually out of chemical equilibrium for what you would expect for a system that doesn't have life at that particular distance from the sun. So there's already this weird, okay, there's either chemistry we don't understand or there's life. 
But it would be underground. That, that the surface of Titan is cold enough to freeze methane and have some methane snow. So you've got a, a you know, ammonia ocean. So you need to go underground, under the surface, and that's where you could have these reserves of liquid water. Well, and you can also have, perhaps, we don't know, life that lives in the methane and ethane. Yeah, that's a whole other kind of life. Yeah, and and we know our planet Earth had methanogens in the past, so the idea of a more methane-oriented life form isn't even alien to our own world. Whoa. And so then there's this idea of panspermia, right? We, we did a whole show on this, this idea that life is moving around the solar system, and, and we know this for sure. We found meteorites from even Vesta, right, and Ceres, and... Um, from Mars and the Moon, and we find these in Antarctica. <laughs> we pick them up off the ice, and something's been traveling around in the solar system for three billion years since it was blasted off. And this idea that every part of of this journey, life can survive. It can survive being blasted off the world. It can survive being in space for a few million years. It can survive reentry, and theoretically. And so you can imagine, right? You you took a meteorite it made the journey to Europa, somehow got into that ocean underneath where it's probably going to be rich in organics, heat sources, it would, it could be happy. Well, I, and it could also be a death plague. And and that's that's the weird thing to think about and it's why we keep sending spacecraft into the atmospheres of, of first Jupiter and now we're going to do it to Cassini in four years with Saturn. There, There's the concern that life may be able to form through cold processes in clays, in ices, and there's been some really ex interesting experiments. There was a radio lab um, on this a while back. And it could be that life independently arose in more than one place. And if we send a rock from here to Europa or a spacecraft or an undersea probe, that it could have the same sort of devastating impact that, well, Europeans had on the New World when they came here. Different biologicals carry different bacteria with different immunities. And, and this is a, a serious concern. Um, so, yeah, there could be life everywhere, and then we could successfully kill it. Uh, one of my favorite... Replace it. <laughs> With our with our locally grown. The bacteria. replacing involves killing. We're terraforming. We're terraforming these worlds. We're killing. Mm -hmm. But like, you can't terraform without killing everything that's there already. My my favorite scientific uh, American capture of all time. I I've brought it up before. Is is one where it discusses the impact that killed the dinosaurs. Uh, created a shock wave that fl flung dirt, plants, and dinosaurs yeah. at escape velocity. The, the impact that terraformed the dinosaurs. And flung them to other worlds. And flung dinosaurs to other worlds. <laughs> yeah. You just imagine some dinosaur just landing, entering the Martian atmosphere and just ha landing on the surface. Wasn't that an episode of uh, South Park? It sounds like there's it, a whale, killer whale, on the surface of the moon. Anyway, um, so that's how the whale got there in Hitchhiker's Guide. Yeah, no, that's a different. That's a different story. That the uh, whale was was part of the infinite improbability drive and was yeah. essentially no, no, creating because of a very unusual thing. But I see what you're saying. I I see what you did there. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so we've got this idea that there's water, water everywhere. So how on Earth or in space? Are we going to be able to study this? I mean, we've got this situation where this water is below 10 kilometers of ice. You've got cryovolcanism. You've got Enceladus. That's tough. So with Enceladus, it's polite enough with the cryovolcanism to fling ice water, um, ice, which is a phase state of water, up into the lack of air where spacecraft can fly through this. And that's actually one of the planned uh, orbital passages of the Cassini miss mission during its, its final four-year phase. They are um, going to fly through where the geysers 
give off all of their particles and they have on board uh, instruments that are actually capable of capturing the particles and measuring what they're made of. So hopefully there will be some nice big ice crystals that are captured and we can look at the salts, we can look at what other materials are in the water, um, look at all of the impurities, confirm that it is H2O and not something else. Um, it's, it's one of those awesome things when space flings things up into reach of spacecraft. Perfect. And then we've got something a little similar happening, I, I guess that's going to happen with Ceres, something's a little similar with what's happening on Europa that there's there's um, uh, plate tectonics, ice plate tectonics on the surface of Europa. So you get the situation where the plates are going to crack open or they're going to be sliding over top of each other and potentially material is going to be at the edges of these, at the subduction zones. You're going to have material from deep underneath being brought to the surface. And it's, it's weird trying to understand exactly how Europa's surface works. And Enceladus is because it's a different mass, even weirder physics in some ways. You have the tiger stripes on Enceladus, which appear to be where the water's escaping. And then with Europa, um, we actually can see all of the organic materials that get sprayed down uh, as, as the water particulates come back down along the cracks. And with Europa, it, it's this mix of tidal tectonics um, and weird hydraulic effects that we're only learning to understand by studying how glaciers are interacting with the seas. Yeah, it's like it's it's like the plate tectonics on Earth, but as you said, it's it's hydrodynamic forces, not rock, which has different physics. Um, so okay, so but then Titan, like how on Earth would you get at the stuff on Titan? Or or as you said before, right? Like what if there is underwater reservoirs on Venus. I mean, that's just for so, so Sampling materials with Titan is another case if you just need a spacecraft to, to pass through one of the ash plumes. Uh, we, we've actually been able to see those in silhouette. Uh, that's less of a stress. It's, it's when we actually want to get deeper samples that it starts to become problematic. Lots we need that sailboat on Titan. Well, yeah, that would work. I I heard this great description. Uh, Titan's surface is such that you could pretty much send anything you wanted, and ideally you'd want something that can go back and forth from swimming to flying to roving. And you have the winds, you have the lakes, you have the, we think, mostly solid surface. And... So you're in this amazing situation where any spacecraft goes. Well, you could fly on Titan. If you had wings, yes, yes. you could fly around on Titan just with your arm strength because the, the, the gravity is so low and yet the density of the atmosphere is so high. It's like twice as dense as the atmosphere on Earth. Like You don't realize that there's this moon that has this dense of an atmosphere that you could work. Of course, it's you know, cold enough to freeze methane, but you know, don't, don't let that worry about it. Yeah. And and the reason it's able to retain this atmosphere is because of that cold. The atmospheric particles are moving so slowly that they're not randomly colliding and hitting escape velocity with their rebound velocities. So Mars is just enough warmer that it struggles a lot more to keep its atmosphere. Yeah. So I guess it sounds to me like you're saying, and tell me if I'm wrong, you think we should send spacecraft everywhere. Well, yeah. Yeah. Why not? I mean, it, it's an awesome solar system out there. Every world needs its own spacecraft. We, right. we should have high-rise cloned um, mm -hmm. and sent to orbit moons. Uh, Curiosities on every place with solid surface. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, the, the one frustration is we're kind of out of our nuclear sources for power. And Curiosity... Uh, it's going strong, but what do we do further out? And we can't go back to spirit and opportunities usage of solar panels because as you get that far away from the sun, you just don't get a high enough density per square centimeter flux, basically. Yeah. Um, By definition, you're out in the cold. Yes. 
and you need some you need a nuclear reactor. That, I'm sure that someone will think of something. I'm sure well, someone's yeah. gonna bring some program back online. <laughs> you you say that and that then Congress gets involved. The problem is the word radiation is involved and radioactive and you have to They don't mind building bombs. They don't mind building bombs, but they, they've actually even largely gotten out of that business. So, so the question is, how do we turn on a facility to create all of the isotopes that are needed for these radiothermal generators? Well, the Chinese will do it then. Yes, that's probably true. There you go. Problem solved. Um, all right. So, 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 but then there are some missions in the works right now, and there's some stuff that's heading out right now. So are there any missions that are even going to get anywhere near trying to help us understand if there's if to follow this trail and continue on this investigation we we are looking at some European uh, missions juice in particular um, basically we're going back to to Jupiter and and as we look more and more at Jupiter uh, as they plan out these missions you always have to worry about losing your pet instrument losing your pet probe but I, I think that Juice may be where our best new hope is at so in what's terms juice? of that people uh, haven't heard of Juice because we haven't talked about it much in this. Well, it's the normal missions are dead to me until they actually launch. Um, but but uh, Juice is a European mission that is going to go to the Jupiter system, and um, I, I have to admit that's pretty much all I know right now, other than Jupiter, people are I see. Exciting. I, see. I I shall Google. Yeah, I forget what Juice stands audience. for. Yeah, well, it's, but it's crazy because we don't have anything at Jupiter right now. No. So when you Google Juice, you get a very cartoonish diagram. It's a European Space Agency mission. Yeah. And uh, it it does have a Ganymede lander planned. Cool. And and so it will do an interplanetary transfer, Earth to Venus, Earth, Earth, so lots and lots of orbiting. It will use Ganymede and Callista for gravitational braking. Um, variety of different orbiters, but landing on Ganymede's kind of the coolest part. It will do two flybys of Europa and then linger at Ganymede and Callisto. And there was the... Uh, so. Juno was launched in in 2011, and that's going to get there in 2016. But I don't think it's going to have the ability to study the the moons. It's it no. doesn't have the budget for it. No. But but Juice is our next big hope. Okay, hope cool. For moon exploration. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then, does this like tell us anything, maybe about about other worlds, other star systems? Because because this is this you know we're at this point, and of course, wouldn't it be great if there's such a thing called the terrestrial planet finder that would be able to uh, to look at the atmospheres of other worlds? But you see some of the characteristics like water in the atmosphere, water vapor in the atmosphere of another world that that's another candidate for for life and the the thing that has me really excited is we're at this point where if we find life even at its lamest single-celled possibility somewhere else here in the solar system that has originated somewhere else in the solar system that starts to give us a sense of how easy it is for for life to come into existence and we're now finding the diversity of locations that life could exist is so much more than that Goldilocks band. Yeah. So the the possibility that we're alone goes down every new time we find a habitable environment. But the other side of that is if we start exploring these liquid environments and we never find life anywhere else, then maybe we do need to slow down and start thinking that maybe it is harder to get life than we'd hoped. So Aww. we're at the point of being able to start getting better numbers for that great 
Dirac equation, sorry, not Dirac, that great the Drake, Drake, Drake equation. equation, the great Drake equation of how probable is life. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thanks, Pamela. Thank you. All right, let's save. Yep. Hold, please. Um, someone asked about, uh, Sylvan Westby asked about the, um, has the, ep the Dragon Con episode made its way to us yet? No, let me drop Rain another email and I'll also ping her on Facebook. Yeah, because that's such a good one. Sorry, just give us one second. Just exporting. And I am literally emailing Ray <laughs> and messaging Good. her on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> and steezing. We're at that time of year where you keep hoping everything will just stop producing pollen, and it doesn't want to. There is no real distinction between what, what allergy season is anymore, is there? This year, we usually, we, we get this span of time in August when everything dies, and I'm good with that. And then they have nice dry corn to harvest, but this year nothing's dried out and the corn is bigger than I've ever seen it and there's still corn smut in the air and yesterday I got thoroughly made fun of for saying I can't wait for all the corn to be gone and it was like it's just gonna come back next year. Yeah, I live in the land of corn. Uh, okay, so here we go. Get ready. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Ready for yes. questions? Uh, um, gen rover that can carry detachable, terrestrial, submersible, or atmospheric packages depending on the target environment. I, this is a conversation we've had a bunch of times, which is that that they need to settle on a space-based platform and a ground-based platform, and then trick them out with the different capabilities that are required for that for the mission, and get really good at building curiosities. You know, well, ten curiosities. And and this goes back to the way a lot of the early probes were. Uh, even Cassini, to a certain degree, was built on the same platform as Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were. For a long time, we were building off of a set platform that had swappable stuff and things, but it was proven technology that they just kept upgrading and upgrading. Um, but we really have gone very much into the, um, let's, let's reinvent the wheel. Yeah, yeah, and that really it really is. Let's reinvent the wheel. You look at what uh, look at what Rosetta looks at, and look how different it looks from Mars Express, and how different that looks from um, uh, Epoxy, and how that looks different from Juno, and like each one is literally from the ground up. Well, and, not and not entirely. To be fair, they do often use the backup instruments from one mission for a new mission. So Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, for instance, has cameras identical to one of the Mars missions. Right, right. And I mean, you can you can see that 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 does make a certain amount of sense. That you're for the mission, you're going to want to have the the structure. Like if you if it's Kepler, it's going to need to have a big mirror, a primary mirror, and it's going to be very different if it's going to be a gamma ray telescope, and it's going to be very different if it's going to be a... So, so there is a certain amount of that, but I don't know, it still just feels like they are still... It's not as efficient as it could be, and I, right. I would be, you know, if I were running the show, I'd be having an assembly line. Um, oh, did you hear, this is, this is totally off topic, but did you hear that Elon Musk said that he's not, he, they're not taking SpaceX public? 
And no, reason, that's kind of awesome, actually. Right. And he said, the reason we're not taking SpaceX public is because SpaceX's job is to create a city on Mars. And if their shareholders get involved, they're going to want to make money as opposed to build a city on Mars. And so SpaceX will never be a public company. That That is all kinds of awesome. Isn't that just so great? You're just like, yeah, now that's commitment. Like, Because he's turning <laughs> down. Because like, what that means to him as the CEO and and big shareholder is he's turning down billions and billions of dollars but it but he knows that if that if it becomes a public company it will not be the play it, it will no longer try to get people to Mars it's amazing there, there's a difference between the things that you have to do to create the best possible product and the things that you have to do to create the most profitable product and and I hate I hate it but too often quality and advancement fall prey to we need to build the cheapest thing that earns the highest profit. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought that was wonderful. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Just like, what I a great thing completely. to say. Um, Rashan Bakari asks, uh, can water in the moons of Jupiter or Saturn be different colors because of microbial life? I, yes. Um, it can also be different colors based on what minerals are in it, what if you think about it, the, the processes that end up creating different colored uh, liquids at Yellowstone, there's no reason that those exact same mineral and bacterial pro pro the processes couldn't also happen anywhere else yeah. in the solar system. Is it Rio Tinto? There's this red river in Spain that's... Yes. A lot of it is... is you know. That one's a little more algae-driven, but yeah, yeah. In, in terms of the springs, the hot springs, volcanic springs that they have at Yellowstone, a lot of that is strangely colored due to mineral processes rather yeah. than due to algae processes. Uh, Guido Bieber asks, Ganymede lander on Ganymede and Titan? Yes, sir. So, um, agreed. A, tight, a, a lander on Ganymede would be awesome. So let's hope the Juice mission pulls it off. Um, Michael Jobin notes that we need better solar cells. Yes, getting but, there, getting there, but solar, but you know, it doesn't help in the outer solar help. system. Yeah, at Pluto, no, you need to go nuclear. And and also the weight to energy ratio is is still not there. And if you want to be highly maneuverable, you don't want giant solar panels. Uh, Thomas Tranecker says, and we actually didn't get into this, which is, are the water molecules forming in the nebula, or do they form somewhere else? Where did it, all that water come from? It, it appears that they probably were part of the solar nebula. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tom Nathy asks, any thoughts on Rosetta's Site J selection? What might they find? Any water, organics, minerals? So, so this is, I think, a result that came out in the past few hours. I know today they're announcing the uh, primary and secondary landing sites for the Philae uh, lander that's currently riding piggyback on Rosetta. Um, I, I have to admit, other than knowing that there's three potential landing sites on the body and two on the head of the great duck, um, I, I don't know which are primary and secondary yet. Um, this is breaking news, and yeah. I wasn't... You were you were recording a show. I was, I was. Yeah, me too. Uh, I'm sure we'll cover it in the uh, weekly yeah. spacing out. Um, Hannes Raiden asks, could a planet have surface water like Earth even outside the habitable zone? No, because that's it's by definition what the habitable zone is. So, so there's a, a few short-lived caveats on that one. One of the reasons that the Earth is so warm is because we have a lot of radioactive decay going on deep within the planet. This generates heat. Heat is given off. We end up giving off more heat than makes sense if it was only due to solar heating. So you could nominally have surface water that was either heated from below via geothermal events or was heated because the whole planet was very hot due to radi radiation. 
but it would require it being large enough that it wouldn't sublimate. That's the problem on Mars is liquid water sublimates pretty much instantly. Mm -hmm. So that's that's sort of the definition, which is that for you to get liquid, the, the, the habitable zone is the place within the solar system where you could get liquid water on the surface of the planet. And obviously Venus in the habitable zone, no A little liquid water. Overshot. Mars in the habitable zone, no liquid water. So yeah. it's it's a it's a it's a rough guide. It's not uh, well, and and I really think we just need to toss the whole idea out the window because tidal heating is so much more important than we really given thought to. Um, Will I to Oni says uh, we need to be sending out probes like the Empire looking for the rebel base. Agreed. Yeah, that's what you want. You yes. want probes, little probes that are just going out one after the other, so many different destinations. We don't talk about the big spacecraft. We talk about the fact that there's 40 probes orbiting Mars. They don't even have names. They're all over the place. They're landing, they're probing, they're prodding, they're exploring, they're swimming. They're, they're everywhere. There's a great plan that as near as I can tell is not being built by anybody that was presented at the Rome European Planetary Sciences Conference I think in 2010 or 2011, I don't remember which. The The plan was to essentially throw lawn darts at Venus and, and they buried themselves except for their little radio antenna and uh, they had a splayed out solar array and I heard someone else say similar for wanting to do that on Mars and and the idea of sending out these lawn darts that would study weather and si uh, seismographic events um, that was awesome. Uh, challenge what is the most the smallest feasible spacecraft that you could just spend, send to Mars that could communicate back with Earth? Like that's I think that would be interesting to see what that would look like some tiny little spacecraft yeah. that has enough of a transmitter to be able to communicate from Mars back to Earth. The the real issue I think becomes how much fuel do you need? Um, yeah, no, I mean this is the, this is I mean you will need some, but you probably need a lot less than something bigger. The point being that could you then get, you know, you can imagine fairly small probes. In fact, you don't even need you just need small probes that then orbit Mars. And then they communicate to some communications array like uh, Mars Express or something like that right. could then get the communications back to Earth. And then you don't need a very big spacecraft at all. So I think, I don't know, it feels like in this era of miniaturization with what we're seeing with the, the microsats, the nanosats, the things are starting to get built, the picosats and launched for pennies on the dollar. Yes. You could start to see some of those technologies get sent to some of these other planets. Like I, I just want to send lawn darts that have radio transmitters and solar panels to, to yeah. Mars to yeah. look at size seismographic events. I mean one of the things we're pretty sure it's a tectonically dead world, but But is it? And and we've we've done a certain amount, but it would be cool to have that full planet weather yeah. grid and just looking to see to see what sorts of tectonics do you get with the evaporation of or sublimation rather of the poles what what Absolutely. there's active dunes imagine if we had a good gps system around mars and we could measure how the dunes are moving the same is true on titan where it also has active dunes and yep. we need weather systems uh, Michael Meyer asks, uh, could there be a gas giant closer to its star than Jupiter with moons with surface water? Yes. Yes. Okay. And or could, it could exist. Totally could exist. In fact, we would get a double, it would get a double warming because it would be in the habitable zone, but also it would probably have the tidal flexing from its, from its planet. So you might get the the two the the tidal flexing keeps the bottom yeah. of the ocean warm, but the rays from the sun keep the top, and it ke it keeps it in balance. So I think you could totally get that. Uh, Tom Trelesky says life may be nice, but can we use the water to create fuels for our space travels? Helium or mm -hmm. hydrogen and oxygen useful elements. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and this is what this is what Mercury would be great for. This is what the Moon might be great for. Is if you can find these deposits of ice, you 
land your spacecraft? So you... I, I think the word great is a little bit of an overestimation because it's still going to be a bear to extricate all of the water from the minerals. Um, so it's it's more a matter of um, could you? Why yes. Uh, is it easy or efficient? No, not so much. You get like some short period comet and you just move it into a nice orbit that's earth trailing and so it's just following the earth and you just refuel there. There, There's a book called I think Leviathan or Leviathan Wakes that talks about uh, future astrolonies uh, mining their ice from the outer icy bodies and bringing it in. Uh, and Michael Meyer is noting I, he says I saw things so, like, how cool is that? Death Valley, salt pool, little critters swimming in the water. Yeah, it's it's kind of amazing. Life likes to live everywhere. Yeah, life will find a way. Um... And there is actually a new form of life found deep in the oceans, these little mushroom-like critters, and they can't figure out where to put them in the tree of life. Aw. All right. Well, I think those are the questions that I wanted to pull out of this. So okay. thanks, everybody, who uh, participated. Really appreciate it. And uh, we will see you all next week. We'll see you next week, Pamela. Anything to announce? Anything to mention? Um, no, maybe next week. Uh, right now, it's simply returning from travel and trying to get everything under control. Cosmo Academy. Go to oh, cosmoacademy.org. I'm going to be in Australia in two weeks. Uh, follow really? my Twitter feed. I'm going to be announcing you can get tickets to come see. I'm going to be at the Siding Springs Observatory's right eye telescope dedication. And then I'm giving a series of different presentations in Melbourne, including at Swinburne University and a variety of other places. There's going to be teacher PD events. Is eye telescopes going to have a, a computer-based telescope located at Siding Springs? Yep. Nice. That we could maybe tap into and observe the night sky from the southern hemisphere? During our daylight, even. During our daylight. I'm liking this idea. <laughs> say, hi to, say hi to everyone there for me. I will. I will. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank you very much, Pamela. Where can people find out more about Dr. Pamela Gay? Uh, you can find me at CosmoQuest.org, and you can find my more personal rantings at StarStrider.com. And are you on the Twitters? I am. I am, in fact, at StarStrider, with a Y, because I wasn't thinking when I was in my early 20s. I'm, I'm at F. Kane. It's very easy. F-C-A-I-N on the Twitters. And, uh, yeah, and then all the other places, the Universe Todays, and, of course, the work I'm doing over on HeroX. All right, well, thanks, Pamela. It's great to see you. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you all next week. Bye-bye, everyone.